This is the Listening Books Podcast, for every kind of reader, and especially for fans of audiobooks. I'm Jessica Stone, and today I offer you this conversation with Emily Pine, who followed up her deeply moving and deeply personal essays, Notes to Self, with her debut novel this year, Ruth and Penn, which tells the stories of two women through the course of one day in Dublin. Ruth, a therapist whose marriage is uncertain, and Penn, an autistic teenager in love with her best friend. Emily, I am so delighted to see you. I was just saying to you earlier that I think the last time I I saw you and spoke to you was on the launch of Notes to Self, and it feels like so much has happened since then, um, not just globally, pandemic and so on, um, but also with your own success. I mean, Notes to Self turned out to be such a big hit um, and, and turned out to resonate so much with readers. And so I guess my first question for you has to do with the differences in your experiences publishing Notes to Self, which I think you said in the in the latest introduction that you actually had a moment of cold feet where you hoped it would just be a quiet release. And you had that potential, I suppose, for it to be a quiet release. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the difference between that experience, publishing Notes to Self, and then publishing Ruth and Penn this year with one of Penguin's big literary imprints. And with that like heft of being a bestseller and that and that weight of expectation. What's that been like? So so just to go back a little bit, I think when you talk about notes being published in 2018, and you're totally right, like I had, I remember it sold like 400 copies in the in the first week. And I thought, well, that's that's all of them. So like how could there possibly be more than 400 people who might read this? So for me, that the the and I think that's coming out of an academic background, right? So for me, and being horribly naive about publishing, and um, for me, the definition of success for notes was to get it into print at all. So partly because it had been a journey of years for me to get to the point where, a, I had work that was written down and that was kind of a manuscript, but. Most importantly, and this is where working with a feminist publisher like Tramp Press was really important, and most importantly, that I had, I valued my own writing and I had ambition for it. And that came from my partner, um, who's also a writer, Ronan Kelly, and the the two editors, uh, Sarah Davis Goff and Lisa Cohen at Tramp Press, just saying, you know, you have a voice, you have a style, this This is something that they were interested in. And whereas I continually thought that no one else would ever be interested in anything. So the the change that happened after it became a bestseller was really internal as well as external. So it felt very different to write Ruth and Penn in that context because Nose to Self was kind of written in in a kind of high energy way, whereas Ruth and Penn was mostly written during a pandemic. Uh, where you know we couldn't like go two kilometers away from the house and and so on and so in a weird in a strange way the writing of Ruth and Penn was was very quiet and it was the kind of but it was also very deliberate like I knew what I was doing I knew that I was sitting down to write a book whereas with Notes to Self I was sitting down to try somehow to record my experience in these kind of short intense essays and to write a novel is is very different. So what I did was I tried to trick myself into making it as like notes as possible by just saying, okay, you just have to write. And I write in very small, you know, the no, the exercise books that you get in school when you're a kid in, in primary school, right? So I write in those notebooks and they have very small pages and very wide um, line spacing. And uh, so I had to do a certain number of those pages a day and that was my way of giving myself really small targets. And I would say that for anybody who is writing or who is thinking about writing or finding it daunting or finding both either their own expectations or other people's expectations, which is, you know, effectively boils down to you're trying to be good. Right? You want to be good. You want you want people to, to like what you write or you want to like yourself what you're writing. 
And to take that expectation and put it to one side and to try to be good, obviously, but not to demand it of oneself. So I try and write, try and trick myself into writing in ways that takes that expectation away. When it came to publishing it, it was it was tricky because in some ways, as you say, I felt a lot of pressure. Um, but in other ways, the continuity was there. I got to work with an amazing editor, Simon Prosser and Hamish Hamilton, um, who was just the most supportive person ever. The And the kind of team, both in Penguin London and in Penguin Ireland, now called Sandy Cove, uh, you know, really just thinking about me as a person and not as a commodity. And I think that's something that's increasingly rare in the publishing industry. And uh, so, so I felt really kind of supported and cherished and nurtured um, through that process. And then also trying to get rid of any expectation again. I mean, that sounds like, I, I don't want to put it in negative terms because I was so excited about, you know, I never thought that I would get to write a novel. I could just, I'm 45 and, and love my life. And 45 is not ancient by any means, but I just thought, oh, that bit is gone. That that was something that I might have done in my 20s or my 30s. And now I'm a, prof- you know, I work in a university and I'm an academic. And so I just thought, wow, this is amazing to be a beginner again. Um, you know, to really exciting. So I just try and go with that. Like there's a, an Australian writer called Madeline Dorr. And she always says, it's when you think about expectations, it's good to go back to your initial expectation. Like what was your goal for this? And my goal was to try to write a novel. And on day one, that looks like a ridiculous girl, you know? Um, and and other people always say, you know, if you put write novel on your to-do list, you will fail every day. But if you put like write 600 words on your to-do list, that's that's an achievable kind of goal. That was quite a long and winding answer on how I think so many of these things are are interlinked. You know, the there's the I there's the there's the private book, which is me and the page or me and the idea of the book and what it means to me personally. And when I look at Ruth and Penn, I think of all of those months, like not leaving the house. I think of the kind of fear. I think of the kind of imaginative risk of it. And then there's the public book. And that's what it means to other people or, you know, what other people assume it to be. And I don't have any control over that. So I just have to let that one go free, which is both exciting and terrifying. (laughs) So maybe that's a good segue to something I'd been thinking about with with Ruth and Penn, actually, uh, because my my book group read that book and I wasn't even the one who chose it. I would have it the next time if it had been my turn, but somebody else chose it and I was delighted. We're, I suppose we're all roughly about the same age and it turned out that we all, we were all drawn to one of the two stories over the other. Of course, Ruth and Penn Mm -hmm. has twin storylines about Ruth and Penn. And uh, and it was interesting that we all sort of connected more with the storyline that was of a similar life stage to us. But it did make me wonder if Ruth's story was what you started off with and if you then decided that it needed another story to go with it? Or how did you decide to pair these two together? That's, yeah, it's really insightful. So I had had Ruth in my head for years, like before Notes to Self, right? Um, as just a character who, and, and I mean as a character rather than the details of what actually is there in the novel, but just as a as a person who felt like, who felt kind of like a survivor, but a really vulnerable one in some way. And so I I had her and in my head and I just couldn't I just couldn't get get her onto the page and it was when I was thinking about kind of what would I write next after notes to self and the really obvious thing was to write a second collection of nonfiction essays and you know the market likes that kind of thing because you know if you've been successful in one genre you should do that but I never do the thing that I'm meant to do because I'm always doing it slightly as my family would say, arseways, or at an angle is the more polite way of putting that. Um, so I started thinking, okay, well, what if I had, I have this time, because I took I took a year off my job is the kind of crucial thing. That's how I had the time to write. What if I gave, have this time and I might never get it again? So I'll go with the, 
with the novel idea, but I couldn't couldn't work out how that would be. And that was exactly when I thought, oh, there's two, there's two characters, two voices here. They need, they need a contrast. They need, they're very different in terms of like how Ruth approaches life is very different to how Penn approaches it. And Penn is autistic. So she has that kind of context for engaging with the outside world. Um, but she's also far more optimistic uh, than Ruth is. You know, she's 16 rather than 40. So she's she's moving forward into her life as opposed to reflecting back on her life. And I just, I really like the idea of those two energies. Um, and my first idea was to set it on the last day of the leaving cert, you know, hmm. that, that kind of iconic moment of finishing school. And, and it would be, you know, that would be Penn's reason for kind of having a, a celebratory day. And it was because I was writer in residence at the National Maturity Hospital and the climate change protests were happening in Marion Square, just outside the hospital. Oh. And I saw everybody gathered there and of all different, and bizarrely, my mother was there that day and listening to the the speeches and I didn't know she was there. And I just thought of, you know, how those kinds of events in a city bring together people from all different parts of, of from all different ages, but all different parts of life. And so I thought, okay, this feels to me both a celebratory moment of, of around the, the kind of energy of protest, but also a difficult moment and worth kind of responding to. And it gave Penn a kind of an identity to think of her, not just as a teenager, but as a teenager who is, really troubled by climate crisis and really determined to add her voice to other people's voices. Um, I also was, it was strange because Ruth and her husband Aidan go through some of the things that I had already documented, having gone through myself in relation to not being able to have children. And I I felt strange kind of writing that again. Uh, And so Pen gave me another way of kind of refracting that story so it didn't feel because because it's emotionally difficult to write if you're going to make emotions real on the page you you know you're going to feel them yourself um so pen was a different way but also pen is 16 and when I was 16 I was not good kid like pen is a good kid right I didn't like reply I mean I didn't mean to have mobile phones so I wasn't getting texts from my mom and my, my, my mother but if I had been I wouldn't have been replying whereas pen does like she's you know, in conversation with her mother and um, she's she's really earnestly trying, whereas I was really earnestly trying not to try as a 16-year-old. So pen is a kind of dimension of myself that I didn't get to write either in my autobiographically, but I got the opportunity to fictionally. So I know this is not a new idea at all, but what strikes me now in hindsight is the extent to which fiction is has an emotional honesty to it, even if the facts look very different from the writer's life and um, that sense of putting true emotions onto the page is a really important one. Did it feel less vulnerable um, to write about something like infertility in fiction format rather than as a personal essay? Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, the, is the short answer. Um, and again, it's not something I, you know, I'm a I'm a do it first, think about it later kind of person. Eat bizarrely, I mean, writing is not writing is a really long, slow process. So in theory, I should have figured out what I was doing it, but I really only figured it out since publishing Ruth and Penn and looking back at it and realizing that I had to I had to move away from nonfiction um, after notes to self because I just I didn't hold back at all in that book. Mm-hmm. And I haven't held back at all in Ruth and Penn, but I managed to do that by it being not my story, not my partner's story, not my family's stories. And just, yeah, just getting a, a greater sense of freedom. So I, I do. And I think mm-hmm. it's interesting now, it wouldn't have occurred to me before, but to look at a writer's kind of collection of books and think about books as reactions to each other. You know, that Ruth and Penn in many ways is a very emotionally in-depth book, but it's not, it's quite quiet in comparison to Notes to Self. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I mean, it's deliberately restrained in a way that Notes to Self was, was at times quite confrontational. And mm. it was funny because I met, I was at a, I was at an event, actually a book club um, event um, recently, and somebody said to me that she couldn't read Notes 
that it was just, you know, it was too bleak. And really? she, she and she was funny because she said, you seem like quite a nice person. And I was like, I, I Thanks. <laughs> um, quite a quite a cheerful person, really. Um, so she but she li- really liked Ruth and Penn because hmm. so it's not just about vulnerability for the author. I think it's about vulnerability for the reader as well. Yeah, I'm. I was wondering as well, you talked a bit, um, again, in this introduction to uh, the current edition of Notes to Self about the response that you've had from the public about the stories that people tell you in response to the vulnerability that you showed uh, in writing Notes to Self. And I'm wondering if you get similar responses or if the responses differ in some way from Ruth and Penn because of that shift I get a lot of uh, people getting in touch with me still about, I mean, again, infertility is the kind of common thread, the common link between the two books. And it's for, it's a subject, and I, God, I hate that word, infertility. I feel like I'm I do defining. Too, but I don't know what else to say. I know, you know, so, uh, or it becomes very long-winded. It's like, you <laughs> yeah. know, the, the quest to have children that remain, you know, and I keep coming <laughs> up against this idea of, of being defined in the negative yeah. and, or defined in relation to lack of success or failure or something. And I, and I hate that. And it's, you know, and somebody asked me this the other day about, uh, you know, writing and continuing to write about some of the same topics. I mean, I feel like I'm done writing about childlessness, but who knows? <laughs> um, the, he said, you know, do you, f-, he was asking me, do you know, do you feel like you've like purged yourself of the trauma? And that was, that was the word that he used. And and I, and I don't think I would use trauma in relation to that part of my life, but it is hard. It is kind of emotionally painful. And what I think, and I think this about living and as well as writing is that one learns to kind of carry it hmm. uh, in ways that hopefully are not damaging to either yourself or myself or to the people who love and surround us. And so that's kind of where I am with that. The So I get people coming to me and and, and usually emailing me um, or at events talking to me at the end, they wouldn't ask a question during the event, would talk to me afterwards, which is, you know, it's a real privilege. It's a real mm. honor to, to have somebody tell you their story because these are very difficult things to talk about. The mm. difference with Ruth and Penn is that I've now, because obviously Penn is autistic, as I mentioned, um, I've now started hearing from people who are autistic or who have autistic children mm. and who will say, you know, who, who effectively then say a bit about how difficult it is to, not just to be neurodiverse in a world that constantly rewards, you know, being neurotypical, um, but also uh, how difficult it is to, I mean, neurodiversity is just so prevalent that I don't understand how it's not in every TV series, not in every novel, and and not in the pejorative kind of mm. cliched ways of you know the the boy with Aspergers who can't make eye contact. You know the so one of the reasons why I had written Pen um, as you know a sixteen year old autistic girl is that. Uh, you know, girls get diagnosed um, with autism much later. Uh, they have different presentations and they're socialized. Girls are just traditionally socialized in ways that mask. And so they do all of this extra emotional, la- emotional labor to continue masking. And I wanted to write about that. And so for me, the, the kind of answer or, or validation for that is hearing from people who have read it or who have just heard me talk about it and say, you know, that that's a kind of an opening um, for them to read more or talk more or to write their own stories because, you know, it should be coming from people who are autistic, not just, you know, an imaginative leap, leap that I'm making. Yeah. Another observation in our book group after we'd read Ruth and Penn uh, that everyone remarked on uh, was how great it was and how... Um, different it was to actually see the pain of childlessness as experienced by a man. Um, And so Aidan's pain um, as this couple work through whether they can stay together, whether, you know, what their life is going to look like. um, I think everybody was really appreciative to see, to see that explored, to see his pain highlighted as well. Do you ever hear from, do you ever hear from men or 
I I do in in oblique ways. So what you're describing was really deliberate, right? So that Mm. came out of, I mean, both a lived experience and noticing that people either didn't ask my partner or kind of asked in kind of slightly rounded, asked how I was, you know, as opposed to asking how he was. And I think there's a kind of discomfort uh, with uh, A, talking about the subject, but also with men's emotions around it. And there's a weird assumption that they don't have emotions, which is obviously ridiculous. It also came out of being at the maternity hospital and noticing how not not in those scenarios, in, in scenarios where, you know, there's a happy, healthy um, baby who has been born, how sidelined um, men are. And so I really wanted it to be apparent that, you know, that fertility is not just a female issue. It's not just an issue for women. And because A, that's terrible for relationships and for wi- for how women are viewed and, and constructed, but also it's, it's terrible for men. And I was at an event actually where I was discussing uh, notes to self and uh, um, a man came up to me at the end and said that he found himself having to read books by women about women about female characters either non-fiction or fiction in order to see his story represented oh wow and I thought what an indictment that was Hmm. of you know how men are male characters and and non-fiction representations are are being imagined and 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 put out there and how vulnerability is is universal um quality um, but it's interesting because you know i have had a couple of people say to me they really don't like how aiden is represented and they find it you know it really um unlikely that he that the man would be the person to say you know that he didn't want to give up on having kids and and I don't want to be kind of, you know, psychology 101, but I was like, well, maybe we, maybe somebody needs to explore why 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 somebody doesn't like this. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, the men I know are 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 not like that. I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Emily Pine. Coming up, we'll hear what it was like for her to narrate the audiobook for Notes to Self. But first, I just want to let you know that if someone you care about would benefit from access to more than 10,000 audiobooks, including Notes to Self, you might like to know that Listening Books does offer gift memberships. Because Listening Books is a charity, the person you're buying this membership for must live in the UK and have an illness, disability, learning difficulty, or mental health condition that makes it difficult to either read the printed word or hold a book. It's really easy to set up, and I'll put a direct link to the gift membership page in the show notes. For more information about Listening Books, head to our website, listening-books.org.uk. In talking about Notes to Self and your, again, I'm going back to this, I'm getting a lot from this introduction because I did find it so interesting um, listening to the audiobook of you reading it and having this introduction uh, in this edition where you can reflect on the experience of it. Um, but one thing stood out to me when you said that you thought you were writing about pain, but you accidentally wrote about love. And I wondered if that realization kind of informed how you approached the stories of Ruth and Penn quite deliberately. Yeah, that's a beautiful link. And I think unconsciously, yes, so the unconscious part being that I wanted I wanted Ruth and Penn to be about difficult things, but I didn't want it to feel like a painful experience to read about those difficult things. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of the unconscious part of that is is kind of protecting maybe myself a little bit, but protecting the reader predominantly. The conscious part was that I was really it, it strikes me that some of the difficult experiences that I write about in Notes to Self are universal. But it also strikes me that a lot of people didn't have terrible childhoods and a lot of people didn't experience sexual violence in their lives and managed to have kind of, no, you know, and normal and inverted commas, but what, but what I mean by that is lives not inflected by terrible things. I mean, a lot of us, a lot of people do have huge hugely painful experiences that they need to to carry um but I really wanted to write about people who 
have difficulty in it and challenges in their life, but aren't falling off a cliff. Mm. And so to think about how that's about how do how do we live a life that's inflected by love as opposed to a life that's inflected by despair. So and mm. and and I wrote this because the the novel is set on a single day and the question for me with Ruth and Aiden is you know are they going to stay together and and when I started writing I didn't know. Hmm. And but again there was a pandemic on and I felt like I really needed some kind of happy ending. And I remember just talking to my sister on the phone kind of constantly uh, just saying, I really want them to stay together. How am I going to do this? And she's like, well, you're writing it. Emily. <laughs> you know? and, and I said, well, they just, they're characters that exist. And she has like zero time for the kind of writing woo woo. So <laughs> she was just <laughs> like, you know, well, but, but we, then we would have conversations. I was like, well, if you've said this to somebody, if you've said something unforgivable to, to the person who you love and who you're meant to care for and care, you know, not just care about, but like mind, right? We're meant to mind each other, mm. but you end up, you know, lashing out in a way that you know is going to be deliberately hurtful to that person because you're hurting yourself. How do you recover from that? And so that for me is, is the question for Ruth and Aiden. And then the question for, for Penn and, and, you know, her best friend slash potential girlfriend, Alice, is like, okay, they don't have any of that backstory. So how do you, how does Penn reach out and risk losing a friendship, you know, in order to to share and expose her feelings? And so for both of those, storylines are just very overtly about the risks we take in order to have love, Mm. in order to live with it. I think one of the things that I really appreciated about the novel was how much kindness is is in there. Um, the you know none of these none of these characters, none of them are monsters. Um, <laughs> everybody is everybody is doing their best, and there's so much there's so much wisdom and so much kindness. Yeah, I just really I really appreciated that you could have that you could build that suspense in the novel. Will they? stay together um, or not without actually making anybody a villain. And I just, I just, I don't like how I phrase that because that doesn't really make sense. It makes sense to me because, because the, that's the thing is like people usually aren't villains. Yeah. And, and even when they're hurting you, you know, they often are. And I, well, I don't mean physically hurting you um, or being emotionally abusive. Let's be really clear about the framework. Sure. That. Yeah. But, I mean, most people are, are are exactly as you say, just doing their best or trying their best. And but I but I also think that you know they're in both literary fiction and in nonfiction now. And and I'm completely aware that what I'm about to say I'm hugely implicated in because of notes to self. But there is a real appetite or market for trauma and for mm. villains and you know, a kind of extremes of emotion. And sometimes I end up worrying, um, particularly when it comes to nonfiction, I got a, you know, I get sent books sometimes and I got a book sent to me recently, you know, before publication and the cover letter from the um, from the marketing department said, you know, you've never seen trauma like this, what this woman has mm-hmm. gone through. And I just, I just, I mean, again, to think about vulnerability of readers, you know, what are we, what are we like feeding people but also um I really wondered who was minding that the woman who had written that memoir yeah and uh yeah so I I think that that you know acts of kindness uh have become increasingly important to me to acknowledge Mm. uh in both in in my life and in writing that's so lovely um Let's talk about the audiobooks. Um, you read Notes to Self um, for the audiobook. Was what well, what was that like for you? That was the hardest thing I've ever done. Really? It was much harder to read it than to write it. And um, there's something about the performance of it that just taps into incredibly deep and unprotected emotions. And the, I remember the recording, the sound engineer, who was really nice and really kind. And uh, I think on my third take of trying to 
describe the death of my niece, um, mm. he said, because I couldn't stop sobbing. There was just no way. It was just no way I was going to get through that. Like, and um, he said, okay, I think we're just going to go with that version. And if they can hear emotion in your voice, then that's that's important for the narrative because that's what yeah. the narrative is doing. And, and I guess that's because I'm not an actor in any way. And so I guess that's what audiobooks, which are narrated, like especially memoirs that are narrated by um, the author, deliver is kind of authenticity rather than kind of the accomplished actor's you know, performance. And, you know, it was really important to me to read notes myself, but I just couldn't imagine somebody else. It, it would have felt very, at that point, it would have felt very kind of disconnecting to me. The audio and my voice needed to go together. And I'm really glad that I made that decision, but it was also draining in a bizarre way. Um, so, but by the time I got mm. to the end of it, especially because that was that, essay that was so difficult was is the second essay in the book and I knew that the fifth essay in the book is also incredibly difficult because about being a teenager and I effectively had to when I read it I was I was pretending that it was about someone else Mm. um uh this person you know and, and that was just a way of of trying to make it real in a sense you know to as in articulating it myself like getting to to speak it myself but not not sobbing into the microphone I felt I feel terrible um for for people listening to it because I just think that must be a very bizarre experience to listen because I'm clearly so I clearly find it so difficult I think any audiobook narrator would tell you that like the experience even when you are not so personally invested in what you're reading is is very draining um, anyway, and when you add to that the um, the emotional component, I genuinely I can only imagine how exhausted you must have been at the end. Yeah, I I definitely I came home, I lay on the sofa, my partner was like, "Okay, I'm getting you tea, I'm making Aww. dinner, you know, do not do not even I couldn't even I couldn't even say thank you. I was just like, okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think. And it was strange because a, a friend of mine wrote, uh, Claire Lynch wrote a great memoir called Small, which is about her and her wife having and their children and the quest to have kids themselves. And she re- reads her, the audiobook of, of um, Small, and and she was going into it. And I said, just so you know, it's going to be the hardest thing. And she kind of looked at me skeptically. And mm. then she texts me afterwards and says, just so you know, you were right. Mm. And so I think that I think that that's what it requires. I think that that's what it asks of you. And so, but I uh, I guess it, <laughs> if one could rewind time, which apparently one can't, uh, I I would probably bring a you know box of Jaffa cakes with me or something to ease me through it. <laughs> That's a good tip. Well, there were also hilarious things that I had I had um, I had worn you know like my favorite outfit kind of you know special day record day one and it rustled constantly it oh, made no. this constant <laughs> noise <laughs> so all of this kind of bizarre practicality I was like oh okay I just gonna I just sat there in my like bog standard t-shirt because it didn't make any noise <laughs> <laughs> yeah all these things that you never even think about until you're sitting in front of a microphone um, exactly so when it came to um Ruth and Penn did you have did you have any input in the casting I did so the so in a couple of ways, uh, the first question was, did I want different voices for different characters mm-hmm. uh, or did I want a single person reading it? And I when I listen to audiobooks, I I really like having a single person. I just mm. I just think that's a kind of bond and I trust that person and then they're going to guide me from the start to the end of the book. And so that was that was really clear to me. And then I was sent a series of um, audio clips uh, from people who could potentially read the book and they were fantastic and I had a real difficulty um, kind of choosing between voices. And I said, you know, let's have this as an ongoing conversation. And so as a result, it kind of paused for a moment and I went, um, I was kind of, you know, went back to work and so on. And then I had this thought, you know, the way sometimes you just wake up and your brain has produced the thought, which was that, 
I had been very lucky in writing the manuscript that I had shared it with Jodie O'Neill, who herself is an actor and um, playwright. And Mm. she had written a play called uh, What I Don't Know About Autism, um, Mm. about uh, autism. And she's autistic herself. And she had shared, she had read the manuscript of Ruth and Penn and given me an By the way, all flaws are my own, Um, but she had given me really great advice on writing pen and, and, you know, pointed out a few things that I was getting wrong. And that was really, really useful for me. And I knew that Jodie was an actor and I thought what a, a wonderfully kind of complete moment it would be if she could potentially read it. And I was really lucky that she was interested and Penguin loved her voice. And so it's now Jodie reading it. And it also has that slight kind of not just the personal connection because I really admire Jodie's work and admire, you know, I love how she's read it, but also that sense that an autistic character gets read by an autistic actor. Yeah. And that was something that I hadn't kind of thought about in advance, uh, but I'm really, really glad that we got the opportunity to do. I'm so glad I asked that question. I had no idea there was such a lovely link there. Um, You mentioned your job. You are a professor of modern drama at University College Dublin. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm just wondering, um, as professor of modern drama, if you see Ruth and Penn being adapted into a film, if you would like something like that to happen, or if you'd like to write from scratch a screenplay? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that that would be lovely uh, if if there is somebody out there. (laughs) (laughs) Because because I think it, it is very visual novel. And mm-hmm. it's about it's about Dublin. Um, but the, you know, yeah, that would be I wouldn't know. How, I wouldn't be writing the screenplay. I wouldn't know how to do that. And I think that's mm. because and I have thought about this because I've actually had a conversation with somebody about it because I don't have the perspective on it. I don't have that. I, I it exists in the novel form for me. And to uh, this exist on stage, my brain doesn't do that bit yet. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be able to transform it. And I one of the reasons why I can say that is because I just um, I wrote a play and it was uh, performed in the Dublin Theatre Festival, um, oh. a play called Good Sex, um, produced by Dead Centre. And the script that I wrote had two characters who come in and effectively sit on a sofa and talk for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and the play that was actually produced and performed because of the brilliance of the director, um, Ben Kidd, you know, was incredibly active and, you know, had lots of different moving parts and characters coming on and off stage and doing lots of things. And so I just, while I, and it's, which is kind of funny for to me because I'm a drama critic and a, and a theatre teacher, but I, I like the word. I really mm. like words. And, um, you know, the translation of that into action, I, I find I'm just, that, that's not where, that, that's not something I can do, and I might say yet, um, but that's not something that I do. And so I love, I loved collaborating on that. And I just think that's, I think, and this is something I say to students all the time about their own writing is know what your strengths are and play to them and know what your weaknesses are and find someone who has, has a strength in that area and, and work with them on that. And mm. so, yeah, so I, I, it's been very exciting collaborating. Uh, and has I've just learned so much. Um, I just realised that uh, we almost got to the end here without talking about Ulysses, which I did <laughs> want to mention because, one, I know that I'm not the first person to see similarities between Ruth and Penn and Ulysses. I suppose the most obvious being that it they both take place in one day in Dublin. Yeah, so I'd love, I'd love to hear you say anything you'd like to say about any of those resonances that were intentional. And then I also want to hear about your experience reading part of Ulysses for Shakespeare and Co. Yeah, so Ulysses is obviously, you know, anybody setting a book in Dublin is going to, in some ways, grapple with Ulysses. And for me, kind of one of the epiphany moments in thinking about how to make Ruth and Penn work was, again, that idea of tricking myself into a, you know, making it smaller and though that sounds ridiculous to say about I don't think Ulysses is small in any way shape or form but you just have 24 hours to work with right and that's kind of genius I mean obviously in in the case of Ulysses it actually is genius but I just (laughs) I learned and I hear so many writers talk about this too the idea that 
that restrictions, like setting yourself limits, actually enables you to start writing. And so I was, I, I, I was able to take the idea of 24 hours and the city and okay, and it's not just kind of the, the hours, it's that Penn lives in Dunleary, which is very close to where Stephen lives in Ulysses, and Ruth's office is close to where Bloom lives. And they kind of, they don't follow the same paths in any way, but that sense of, okay, they're going to cross the river a couple of times mm. and they're going to move around the city. And each location is going to have a different emotional resonance. It's going to produce a new bit of narrative. And which is the most kind of minimal and strategic reading of Ulysses of all time, but was really enabling for me. And of course, in terms of the style of writing, it's much closer to Mrs. Dalloway. Mm. It, and and again, I'm not comparing myself to Virginia Woolf. She's obviously much better than me. <laughs> <laughs> but the but the um but the goal, the ambition, right? And and, mm. and partly because I was like, well, if you're gonna if you're gonna try to write a modernist novel because that's your favorite kind of writing, may as well aim high. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then at that point, I had to take both novels and put them in a different room away from me so that I wasn't during the writing process, picking them up and comparing myself because that way lies mm. despair because you'll pick up one of those novels, read a sentence and think, well, there's zero point me writing anything ever because I will never be as good as this. So I think, you know, if I'm in a boat, my metaphors are always terrible, by the way, warning. <laughs> um, but if I'm, if I'm, if me writing Ruth and Penn is being in a boat trying to sail it somewhere, I think of uh, Ulysses and Mrs. Dalloway as lighthouses. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, Shakespeare and Company are obviously such an iconic uh, and important bookshop. And it was such a privilege that they asked me to read part of Molly Bloom's soliloquy <gasps> for the centenary. So, I mean, what a lucky bit wow. I got as well, right? Yeah. Oh, my goodness, you realise how long that is. Like, you <laughs> have to read only part of it. I didn't even read the whole thing. I just read a section of it. And it took I mean, it's long and, you know, and also involved me doing the thing of like, you know, being under the duvet and trying to <laughs> record it. And, you know, would I read it off screen or all of those kind of little practical things because I wanted to get it right. But the thing that I did that I had to do was I had to punctuate it. Mm. I couldn't read it as written. And so I, I, violated Joyce's, you know, perfect text by put, putting in commas and full stops and giving myself the opportunity to breathe every so often. But again, it's, and it's a, I guess it's a sort of mirror to reading the audiobook for notes, which is you learn a text, you experience a text in a completely different way when you are speaking it out loud. Mm -hmm. And a, a kind of a profound sense of connection to the word and to just the beauty and you know dexterity and you know mobility of Joyce's writing is was just extraordinary so I was I was blown away and um, by the experience both kind of being included I was like oh my god me but I'm only a small person um and then you know actually getting to the experience of doing it was amazing too and to read Molly as well I mean that's mm -hmm. um that's incredible this year of course is the centennial of the publication of James Joyce's Ulysses. And it was published by Shakespeare and Company, uh, which is that iconic bookshop in Paris. Uh, it was run by Sylvia Beach at the time, who was, by all accounts, just an incredible publisher and who really took Joyce under her wing and made that book happen. Anyway, they did a, a great project this year to honour that um, 100th anniversary of its publishing uh, by inviting different writers and um and famous people to read these uh these incredible words that have been with us since 1922 and it's interesting when you reflect on Sylvia Beach's role you know to to remind ourselves that the great geniuses weren't always considered so that you mm. know it was incredibly difficult for him to get published and that it it takes risk takers like Sylvia Beach uh, to who who might be slight outsiders themselves to see the value and the worth uh, in creating a book that that has got on to be whatever top every single most you know important books list of of the twentieth century. And um, so yeah, amazing. 
Emily, I feel like you've offered just as much wisdom and kindness in this conversation as as you do in your books. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for asking me, Jess. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. And thank you for listening. You can find Notes to Self and Ruth and Pen in your local bookshop. Both would make excellent gifts for the discerning reader in your life. And as I mentioned earlier, gift memberships to Listening Books are available on our website. The Listening Books podcast is produced by Listening Books, a UK charity that provides an audiobook lending service for over 115,000 members who find that an illness, disability, learning difficulty, or mental health condition affects their ability to read the printed word or hold a book. It's simple to join. For more information, head to our website, www.listening-books.org.uk. 